When you think of railways, the first thing that usually pops into mind is trains. Understandable as it's the thing you climb aboard whether it's on a day trip, overnight sleeper or the dreaded sweaty commuter service. But a railway is more than just its vehicles. True, they are often the draw for passengers, however they are just one part of the greater machine. The rails are pretty important. Well, it is in its name. They are the unsung heroes and their healthy condition can never be understated. Today's video is about the rails and the highly complex parts around point work. Welcome to Plainly Difficult and in this video we are looking at the Potter's Bar rail disaster. Background. So I'm going to divide this video's context filling in section into two parts. One a brief history of Potter's Bar train station and another on the geeky side of point work. My main research material came in the form for this video from the HSC report and the RSSB investigation into the disaster and as always the linkies will be in the description below. I'll also link in some other bits and pieces as we go along such as newspaper articles. Oh, and also I'll be drawing on my experience in the rail industry as well. Now you don't get an image like this from a good day at the office. I should say this is probably the first picture I've ever actually seen of Potter's Bar train station. Anywho, catastrophe aside, the town of Potter's Bar has a railway station, is roughly 12 miles and 57 chains from London and is in the county of Hertfordshire, which is around here on a map. As a side note, a chain is a measurement of distance and there are 80 to a mile and on the railway we still use chains for some reason as well as kilometres, feet, yards and metres just because, well, the UK is a messed up measurement living nightmare. I like to call it imperimetric. The station opened in its first form in 1850 and saw changes to its buildings and platforms over the years. Its final layout had two 160 metre long 11 metre wide island platforms which were partially covered by reinforced concrete canopies which were installed in the 1950s. The station serves stopping services but also is part of the east coast mainline as such trains go fast through the station. The track layout was down slow for stopping services, down fast for non-stopping trains and up fast and up slow. And down in our case today means away from London and up is towards London. The line speed is 115 miles an hour, at least it was in 2002 and to allow trains to change lines there are points at the southern London end of the station. This allows down fast trains to cross over onto the slow lines and for up fast and slow services to change tracks. The layout also allowed a train to come into Potter's Bar on the down slow, terminate, allow for the driver to change ends and then head back towards London on the fast or slow lines. Regardless, all we really need to know is that there are points here and it's pretty common across many stations in the United Kingdom as it affords flexibility in what services trains can run. In particular, at Potter's Bar, the point's normal position was set for straight through running. From the perspective of track maintenance, the point work south of Potter's Bar was designated a red zone, i.e. working on the area brought in the risks of train movements and would likely need a line block, in layman's terms, to stop all trains in the area, in order to inspect or maintain the infrastructure. The term red zone is no longer used in the current rulebook, however when this disaster happened, which was 2002, it was. So needless to say, having the points in this area adds some aggro to maintenance work on site. Well with all this chat about point work, let's have a look eh? So points or switches as are known in some other places in the world allow trains to change lines. They are vital in enabling multiple trains to run on a network as if they didn't exist then trains would just be locked into one particular track and just go up and down. Points are simple but ingenious, they are made of several very important components. First of all there are the stock rails and these are fixed. Then you have the switch rails or blades. These can move and depending on the intended direction allow the wheel to run along it. You see the train wheel flanges are like this and thus they need to be able to cross the rail. This is done here with the actual crossing section, basically an interruption of the railhead to allow the wheel to slip through. 
Finally, once the wheels have moved over the points, they go through a thing called a check rail but make sure the wheel is in the correct position. So with the blades moving, there is a risk that they can go out of gauge, i.e. too wide or too narrow for the wheels distance between each other. In the UK, the standard gauge is used, which is four foot, eight and a half inches wide. This holding of gauge is done by things called stretcher bars. These can be adjusted as they have threaded ends, which pass through a support bracket in which a nut each side is threaded on. The bracket is then attached to the switch rail. And the points machine was attached to the points via a lock stretcher bar. Now today's story will be mainly about this set of points to the south of Potter's Bar, numbered 2182. Needless to say, maintenance is key for their safe operation, as being on the fast lines they take quite a beating from very heavy and quick moving trains. Now the area is remotely controlled by the King's Cross signal box and the line is electrified with overhead lines of 25 kilovolts of AC. So that was a basic background, let's have a little advert break. Great to see you back, so I need to quickly mention something that is rather important to our story and that is of a rough ride. Now it's not what your dirty mind is thinking of, it's actually an event of a train passing over a section of track and for whatever reason is bounced around causing the feeling of a train to be not stable or rough ride as you will. Many things can cause this, a roaded ballast track, out of gauge rails, a train's wheels hunting round corners, broken fish plates, loads of things really, but also a rough ride can be caused by faulty point work. How? The exact location of a rough ride is pinpointed really depends on who reports it. For example, if it's a driver, then they can get a mile post number, a stanchion number, signal number, or even nearest junction name. The list is very exhaustive. Such events are easily zeroed in on, but it's much more difficult if a passenger reports it because, well, they might just say it happened between X and Y station, making a search area of miles of track rather than just a few yards. But regardless of how a rough ride is reported, the way it's investigated is usually the same. A train will be held at a red signal before the affected area, after which the signaller will inform the driver of a rough ride and to proceed at caution over the affected area when, at a pre-agreed location, the driver is then to contact the signaller and report their findings. This type of house of course working is fairly regular. Depending on what the driver says, another few more trains can also inspect the area, and if a problem is found, then track workers are sent to the site. And now we can start with our disaster narrative, so get your bingo cards at the ready. The disaster. So our story begins the evening before the crash on the 9th of May 2002. A station announcer is travelling home from Finsbury Park to his home in Stevenage. This is at around 9pm in the evening. As the train is travelling towards Potter's Bar, actually I'll tell you in the person's own words as written in page 61 of the RSSB final report. The train dipped to the left hand side. It then seemed to jolt downwards. Then. As it passed over the down fast to down slow points, it dipped to the left. As it travelled across the bridge over Dark's Lane, the train lifted and leant to the left, passed over the bridge and then leant back to the right as it came off the bridge. When the staff member got to Stevenage, he reported the rough ride. The station supervisor then reported it further up the chain of command to the signal. Some confusion came around as to who had reported the rough ride and as to what line and points it had occurred on. As somewhere along the communications chain, the report of a rough ride was taken to be on the up fast service rather than actually on the down fast service. Nevertheless, a rail track member of staff went down to investigate. He was looking at the points on the up fast, shining his torch over the stretcher bars and their support brackets and associated bolts and nuts and all looked good. The member of staff informed the signal box all looked good and well, but he would wait to observe the next up fast service travel over the points. Everything was fine, and as such, the report went no further. However, he had been looking at the wrong points. It is just after lunch on the 10th of May 2002, and train 2 Papa 26 is departing King's Cross. The 12.34 service was set to run along the fast line and cross onto the slow at Potter's Bar. This was to allow a fast service to overtake it. This was the 12.45 Kings Cross to Kings Lynn train with the head code of 1 Tango 60. 
The stopping service navigated the points and the signal at King's Cross saw no issues with setting the route and resetting the points to 182 back to their normal through running position. All the required route set lights were showing on the signaller's panel. Now, the fast service was operated by West Anglia Great Northern and was a four-car class 365 unit capable of a top speed of 100 miles an hour. It had departed King's Cross on time and along its journey the train was happily climbing up to its top speed. As train 1 Tango 60 approached Potter's Bar, the driver noticed the signal on the downslope just outside the station change from green to red and then back to green again. As the front of the train reached the platform at Potter's Bar, the driver noticed a strange jolt, followed by more severe jolts. The driver took the power off. All of a sudden his line light extinguished and the train began to give alarms. Normally when the line light goes out, it means you've got no juice, i.e. electricity. And this was the case, well kind of. Actually what had happened was that the train had separated, but the driver didn't know this until the train came up in a heap. So as the train had gone over the set of points, the first two carriages and first bogey of the third had successfully made it across. The rear bogey of the third carriage had become derailed, and the rear bogey of the fourth carriage derailed and then re-railed onto the crossover, pushing it broadside to the direction of travel. The fourth carriage became detached from the rest of the formation and, running at an angle to the track direction, flipped and crashed into the platform at Potter's Bar, becoming lodged at a 45 degree angle underneath the canopy, resulting in this. During the flip, the bridge over Dark's Lane was smashed into, sending debris and masonry smashing into the road below, in doing so striking passerby Agnes Quinlivan, killing her. So by now, the three remaining carriages had come to a stop. The signaller noticed several sections becoming occupied on his panel, this along with point work showing out of alignment, and it prompted the signaller to replace all down signals in the area to danger. A rail track production supervisor at Potter's Bar called the signaller, informing them that a major accident had occurred. Soon enough, it was apparent that six people aboard the rear carriage of the train had died and in addition of Agnes Quinlivan, the death toll as reported by the Guardian newspaper, Medic said five people had died at the scene, and two further people died later in hospital. Hertfordshire and Bedfordshire Ambulance Services said a further 15 people had serious injuries. Some of these are now said to be critical. A local GP assessed 70 walking wounded. Now there was one hell of a mess to be cleared up and lead us to say the cause had to be found out. And this leads us up to the next section of the video. Aftermath and Investigation The Health and Safety Executive set up an investigation board, and along with Railtrack, Her Majesty's Rail Inspectorate, the British Transport Police, and the RSSB looked into the immediate and underlying causes of the derailment. Now the report of a rough ride was more than a coincidence. And when investigators looked over the crash site, it was clear to see that the points had played a part. The physical evidence allowed the HSC to reconstruct events alongside the trains on board data recorder. Clearly the points were the cause of the derailment, but why? Well, two theories would be thrown out, so let's start with the least credible. I should prefix this theory with, don't forget this is 2002 and terrorism was on a lot of people's minds. So, the engineering company in charge of maintenance of the point work in the area, called Jarvis Rail, would push out the theory of sabotage. Yes, rather bizarre, I know, and it was easily refutable, with the evidence at the crash scene, and especially when investigators looked at other Jarvis Rail maintained point work, other issues, shall we say, could be seen in their maintenance schedules. You see, interestingly, during the investigation, the points in question had actually had some maintenance work undertaken on them by Jarvis Rail on the 1st of May, just a few days before. And during interviews with Jarvis staff, it became clear that many didn't really understand the type of adjustable stretcher bars used on the points. In the RSSB final report, they would say, The lack of a training program was the result of the failure to produce a procedure for the installation of adjustable stretcher bar assemblies, despite the stated intention in 1993 to do so. Ah, so maybe sabotage was not the cause then. Maybe 
Jarvis Rail was undertaking a little case of deflection. This leads us on to the second and more likely cause, in that the point stretcher assemblies were not properly tightened, thus allowing them to gradually become loose and interfere with the running of trains. It was also found that vibrations from passing trains could cause the stretcher bars nuts to work themselves free. The poor maintenance sadly could have been discovered when the rough ride was reported, but the breakdown in communication between the reporting staff member, the signaler and track worker meant that the wrong set of points was investigated. The HSC would summarise this point. There appears at this stage to have been a failure to recognise safety-related defects in the setup and condition of points 2182A and to record or report them. There were deficiencies in the response to a report of a rough ride in the area of the points south of Potter's Bar Station on the night before the derailment occurred, the 9th of May 2002. Thank you, Mr. Jago. So the disaster was really just down to common issues, unpreparedness of managers and staff to maintain and highlight issues within complex machinery. Sadly, this resulted in seven deaths. Not only that, but it became the nail in the coffin for a rather controversial private company, Railtrack, which was in charge of maintenance of signalling, track and most of the UK stations in a post-UK railway privatisation world. You see, Railtrack had subbed out nearly every job it could to contractors, which resulted in substandard infrastructure. As you know, running a rail network's assets for profit doesn't always get great results. By the time the Potter's Bar disaster had happened, Railtrack was actually in administration, and a new publicly owned company called Network Rail was to rise out of the ashes. Now the fines. Network Rail got hit with a £3 million penalty a few years after the crash in 2010. Jarvis Rail, who originally posited that sabotage theory, ended up admitting liability, setting aside £3 million itself for claims against the company. Network Rail moved towards reducing its contractor usage. However, we've seen more contractor staff on the railway recently, which may be a worrying sign. The disaster marked a low point in a bloody few years in the UK railway industry, but has become less well known compared to Labrick Grove and Southall. But to me, it is actually even more scary as the disaster didn't come from a driver error, but a fundamental problem with maintenance. Now disaster scale time is going to be a four for me, and I've got this for my bingo card. Do you agree? This is a Plain Deal Foot production. All videos on the channel are Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike licensed. Plain Deal Foot videos are produced by me, John, in a currently very, very cold corner of southern London, UK. I have a second YouTube channel, Instagram, and Twitter, or if you want to call it X. So check that out for other bits and pieces I get up to. And I'd like to say a very warm thank you to my Patreon and YouTube members for your financial support, as well as the rest of you for tuning in every week to watch these videos. And all that's left to say, is thank you for watching, and Mr. Music, play us out please.